Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of the IP3 podcast. I'm Kevin. I'm Alex. And today we're joined by none other than calling Hartford champion Mark Morrison. Uh, How's it going, everybody? Thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. Uh, we're going to have a lot of questions for you uh, about about your weekend and the crazy ride that got you uh, all the way to the top and that beautiful, beautiful cold foil balance of justice. Uh, But before we hit to that, we got a few uh, quick uh, things to cover across uh, Flesh and Blood news. Uh, First things first, Alex, uh, I think Heavy Hitters made quite an impact in its first weekend. I would say so. KO, uh, played by Yuki Lee Bender, won uh, Hartford, battle, the battle Harden that was secondary to the calling. Uh, in Manila, the battle Harden was Blitz, won by uh, the, the old young Victor. And then in the Manila PTI, which was constructed, uh, it was a Kasai Bravo finals, which the Bravo ended up winning. But um, And then obviously... Mark won the the old draft calling with KO, but I was guaranteed to be a heavy hitters hero. So heavy hitters has made an impact for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think KO in particular is you know it, it was a poorly kept secret before how how good and just raw on rate that deck was, uh, and you know an eleven zero run in a Pretty pretty good size CC tournament in its first weekend in existence is uh, certainly bodes well for his future potential into the RTN season. How many times have we talked to Colin and said, "Man, if Brutes just had one more blue six power, they would be like so much more consistent." It turns out, KO, you can just have all of them. You can just have any of them. Yeah. Uh... Turns out 54 cards that are 6 power. You hit your bear fangs all the time. It's great. But all right, one one more quick item before we start talking about Hartford. Uh, last time around on our Mondo three-hour-long uh, Heavy Hitters limited set review, at the end, we promised that if you left a comment mentioning the word balloons... <laughs> That meant you got all the way to the end of our three-hour extravaganza. Uh, and we had three different people uh, who specifically went out of their way to comment. So congratulations to Private Yarek, Defunks, and JC McQuinn 1392 uh, Each of the three of y'all are going to get one of these awesome resource counters from past ProQuest season. So... Uh, and I have to I have to be honest here. I was reading through the comments and like, why are all these people talking about balloons? It was the the three hour fever dream. I forgot that it was me who said, "Hey, you should comment the word balloons." I it took me about a week of reading those comments and trying to figure out why people were talking about balloons. Uh, That's really impressive that they sat through all three hours to get to and and still comments at the afterwards. Yeah, you only listen to all of it to learn everything you needed to know about Sealed so that you could win a calling. That's You just didn't end up leaving a comment, you know, yeah. right? I also right. I also did it in shifts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was listening to it on, on my drives to volleyball uh, every other day, and that's like a half hour each way. So it took me, it took me a few days to get there, but I did listen <laughs> through, your, through the whole podcast. Yeah. Next time, it'll be a little more curtailed, a little more... Uh reasonably sized i think but it was still fun to do but uh awesome yeah and mark because you watched the whole thing if you also want one of these resource coins buddy i got you i got you no it's got to comment balloons what are you doing Kevin? <laughs> rules we have rules for a reason look the man want a calling he gets to he gets to just have some special treatment that's all there is to it um, at the start of this uh uh Kevin and I are captains for Team Eclipse, which Mark is a member of. So we're very happy that Mark... Well, one of the team goals this year was to put Team Eclipse on the map so people know that we exist. 
and the goal is done in February. <laughs> That's way, cool. way ahead of schedule. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, knowing Mark and playing against Mark, um, he plays the the easiest to get cards, like lowest rarity, like wh- whatever, could just the card that can get in his deck, not fancy whatsoever, and then you win one of the fanciest cards <laughs> in the whole game. So that's yeah. pretty unlikely. I, I, I owned that card for maybe five minutes before it was out of my possession. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> on brand. Very, very on brand for Mark. Uh, I still have to get a copy of Balance of Justice for my draw my deck. It's still <laughs> something that needs to happen. The ultimate <laughs> irony. The ultimate irony. Oh, man. All right. Well, many, many rounds prior to your finals win. Uh, day one of Hartford was sealed. Day two was drafts. But uh, as we, you know, talk talk through how the event went for you, I guess for your sealed deck on day one, you ended up going six and two. Um, and what, I guess, how did you feel the day went? How good did you feel your deck was? Like, do you feel it was a particularly above average pool or? Yeah, when I first opened the pool, um, obviously, well, I guess not obviously for people who weren't there, when you're at a, 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 a sealed calling, you get to open all your packs, but you don't really get to build at that time. What you do is you pass all your cards to a person across from you, and they register the pool. So I got to quickly open all, open all the packs, quickly glance through the cards, and the, the thing I noticed when I was opening the cards, a lot I had a lot of the Power Brute cards. The main card I saw was Knucklehead, the, the a KO. Is that how you pronounce it? K O K O. K O. I'm gonna mis- I'm gonna mispronounce it throughout this entire well, entire podcast. The original I the original printing doubled the power, so you would like hit somebody <laughs> for like 20 damage, and you would just K O them in one hit. Oh, that's yeah. it's a pun on words. I like it. Yep. <laughs> it's a pun. Yeah, Elsa's done that once or twice. <laughs> just a few times. <laughs> yeah. So one of the one of the big power cards I opened up, I, at least I glanced at, was Knucklehead. So I figured that if I can just have, you know, some strong reds, some powerful red sevens, enough enough of blue three uh three blocks, that I should be able to form, you know, a decent uh KO deck. Um when I finally got to see my entire pool, not only did I uh, find that I had a decent KO pool, I thought I probably I might have had one of the best pools in the room. Um it I quickly realized I quick I quickly learned as I was playing my rounds I didn't have the best pool in the room, but I probably had one of the top five pools, um, which which definitely carried me to my strong day one start. And we are going we Mark was nice enough to uh make a uh February link for each of his uh the sealed deck, the draft one, draft two, and then the top eight draft. So we'll post those lists so you can see what they entail they don't have like his seal deck doesn't have all the other class cards he just basically any cards that he might have played in his ko deck will be there and what made this sealed pool particularly powerful was i had nearly perfect armor suite like i said i got the knucklehead i had raw meat i had flat trackers I didn't have like the best arm piece, but I still had a very strong arm piece, especially considering that I was expecting to see many mirror matches. So I had an ad, uh, embrace adversity, which is great because it's a two block if my opponent has a might token. Yeah. Yeah. So I my mean, armor yeah. really carried me throughout day one. Your your sealed pool is, is reminiscent of what I would consider a, a pretty good KO draft deck looking like. If I'm being honest, the you had a lot of red sevens. You know, the 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 correct cards were red, and the you know less important things were blue. And even your blues weren't bad. And you had a reasonable quantity of three blocks. Um, yeah, and I also had sideboard cards if I ran up against fatigue. Like I had two red adrenaline rushes that I didn't play, which are still very solid cards. I had a no fear in um in my pool, so I can bring in against Kasai. I had a starting stake, which is a great, great yellow defensive card. And if I w- was really afraid of, of, you know, of going against fatigue, I also had a, a yellow tenacity, which is, you know, it blocks and it's a decent attack. Yeah, I, I, I forget if we were talking about that on the drive to Hartford or not, but we're discussing tenacity and how, how good it, it 
is or could be. Uh, and, you know, I think I, I was initially underestimating it, but, you know, in, in your mind, you're like, oh, this is the greatest one card follow up. If someone's like, OK, I'm going to hold my cards back, throw a bunch of equipment in front of, you know, any old vanilla damage this turn just to soak it up. And if you just follow up with a tenacity for four or five, that's at least on rate. At a, at a exactly. four and above at five or six. Yeah, and and tenacity is worse than I was first thinking. I didn't realize that the attack ability that the, the attack is a triggered ability. So it says when you attack, um, it gets plus one attack for every card that's currently on the chain. So I was thinking that it got bigger for cards added to the chain. I thought it was a static ability. So it it was slightly it wasn't as good as I was expecting, but I did cast it a few times throughout day one, and it it was strong every time. So obviously, uh, you see Knucklehead, a uh, Temper Two equipment, and you're like, "Can I play? Can I play Brute?" <laughs> uh, were there any other cards in any of the other classes that like made you even consider Warrior or Guardian? So g- going into day one, um, I guess be- before even coming to the calling, I I had a lot of free time to practice uh, sealed and draft. So I guess you know heavy hitters limited. Um, I I, tr- I wanted to play every single hero against every single matchup, so I got to play against all six heroes versus the other the other heroes. Um, one of the common themes that I found was I was unable to win a single game with any of the guardian heroes, um, and it wasn't due to the my cards being poor. Like it wasn't a poor draft or a poor poor sealed pool that I would open when I when I would play those decks. I just I'm doing something wrong inherently when I play those decks. I don't know what it is quite yet. Um, I'm not good enough to be able to still look back and understand why I am not winning with those decks. So going into Hartford, I knew that I would I was going to play either Warrior or Brute, and I did I just ignored Guardian the entire weekend. Who knows your your Guardian pool could have been even better. It, it, there's there's a shot that it could have been, but uh, looking at the uh, all my armor pieces that and they were brute. It's it's really hard to believe that my guardian pool could have been any better than this. Uh, my warrior pool was decent. It actually had a couple more red sevens, uh, which made me w- w- consider playing it. Uh, so I did look at the warrior pool, but even with the the two additional red sevens I could have played, the fact that I had the best armor, the armor slots for for brute, you know, it, it's essentially six ex- extra life with uh, knucklehead and raw meat. I I thought that that six life would push me uh, far ahead that I needed to play brute. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, that that equipment suite, like embrace adversity, is good. I feel like. The, the the might generating one uh you know is uh i don't know i i guess in in my mind part of the the ideal brute loadout but you know if you tend to be blocking with it more anyways two thirds of the time embrace adversity is just going to be one more one more life for you so uh and yeah. rummy gets turned on by the the two equipment pieces the flat trackers and the uh the gauntlet of might and mm-hmm. then also the matchback Ilhorn, which your pool also had. And then also, as KO, if you discard an Agile windup, it also turns on the raw meat. So Brute actually has quite a few ways to turn on their own, uh, like, Temper 2 equipment. Right. I was expecting to be, to be able to get the full 3 block out of raw meat consistently. Um, in practice, I actually didn't get there in it, with this sealed pool. I didn't have as much agility as I thought I did. I think I only had one Angel wind up. I I don't think I had any lead the speeds. Um and I I did have the flat trackers though, but it helped, but I I was missing agility quite a bit with this deck. So what I ended up actually doing instead of being the brute go wide uh every turn was be more of like a mid-range brute deck since I had the armor, I could block every turn. I would just try to block block 6 and then swing 7 every turn. And essentially I was trying to fatigue all my opponents. Um, and that was the plan, um, and then that ended up working out. Um, just, I, I actually learned that strategy uh, on the drive to Hartford. We were li- listening to the Runaways podcast, and uh, Cody Williams, who I ended up playing in the finals, <laughs> uh, mentioned that it, uh, when, when he looks at the sealed pool, he wants to play the class that has the most red sevens. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why. And, I, and as I, I really thought about it, I understand that process. Like, oh, if you're always blocking six, swinging for seven, and you have more cards in your opponent, and, th- and then your opponent in their deck, you're always going to win the long game. Shout out, Cody. Uh, so, 
so for sealed, uh, any notable games that you played on in day one? Stuff that stands out, good or bad? Um, I, I would say the one that stands out the most was my round two opponent, uh, Corey. I, I'm sorry for butchering your last name, Franscati Robinson. He probably had the most insane sealed pool I've seen in any card game. Um, he ended up playing KO. He had two cast bones. He had, I think, 27 sixes in his deck. Um, it, and th there's a reason why he 8-0'd. <laughs> he was one of two people who finished 8-0 eight, eight, eight day one. His deck was amazing. Um, and he, he, I think he low rolled against me too. He, he definitely uh, randomly discarded non-sixes against me. And he didn't get to cast <laughs> any of the cast bones. But um, the worst part of his deck was he didn't have the perfect armor suite, but the deck was powerful enough that it didn't matter. I just remember that I was thinking that I had the best sealed pool, and when I played against Corey, I was like, oh no, this, this, is, what, uh, this is the sealed pool that everyone talks about. Sealed pool um, but when it <laughs> dreams of. <laughs> exactly. Um, but when it comes to like, other matches... Um, I, my, my, I don't think my, my day one was very exciting since it was mainly just the fatigue plan. Most of the games, I was just blocking six, swinging for seven. So if you're not like, if you're into like super flashy flesh and blood, that wasn't what I was doing. I was playing slow, grind them out, um, just get my opponent, opponent's deck down. There was one game that I got really close to dying against a victor. I think it was round, round seven against Matthew uh, Van Patten. Um, he was playing Victor. He had the the also the specialization, the the overpower attack, which was something that I just wasn't playing around. Um, so I actually didn't block enough against him. And when he drew it and swung, you know, he sac he sacrificed the gold and swung with the overpower. And I, I was actually light in armor at the time. Um, if I didn't have a three block in my hand, I would have just died. Luckily, I did have the three block block. I was able to stabilize at one and then uh, swing for lethal next turn. But that was a game that was much closer than I was expecting. Yeah, specializations in the set are good. Yeah, yes, they are. Yeah. Except maybe, uh, yeah. except maybe, <laughs> maybe KOs, but uh, that's fine. His helmet's great. Yeah. Uh, and, and then an, an, another game that I I can't remember the name of my opponent or, or or what round it was, but I remember that I was at two or three life. I I can't can't remember the exact life total, but um, my opponent had a card in his arsenal. Um, he was playing Kasai, so I assumed it was an attack reaction. Um, and when I when he went through his deck a couple times, like um, when I saw it originally, I couldn't remember any more red attack actions. So I was pretty sure it was the yellow attack action that he can only pump two. So when he went in for an attack um, that I had to block, um, I I only overblocked by by one because I he, uh, if it was just a plus two attack, I couldn't I couldn't uh, die. So I overblocked with one with my armor piece, and then I was able to crack back for lethal uh, on my on my turn. And then my opponent made the comment, "It's like, did you remember that uh, I uh, I didn't have any? That he didn't have any any red uh, red attack reactions left?" And that was the one time that I, I was paying attention to my opponent's pitch deck and did I was hoping that that uh, he didn't somehow hide a red attack action somewhere. So yes, that was a chance I took, but it was a, a more of a, an educated guess there. Calculated risk. Yeah, I got to I got to watch that game over your shoulder, or at least like the latter half of it, and watching your blocking decisions. And I'm just like, like this block's really good if you know your opponent doesn't have specifically red fatal engagement, and then your opponent promptly played yellow fatal engagement from Arsenal. And I'm like, maybe that was just really lucky. But now we <laughs> talked afterwards, and nope, you you know you were you were pretty sure it wasn't a red. So. Mm. Tracking, tracking that pitch stack and certain cards that get pitched can certainly have a huge impact. Um, so, so your day one losses then was it was round two to the d double cast bones KO pool. Uh, what was your other loss on the day? Yeah, I I lost um, relatively early in the tournament. I think it was I guess I say relatively early. I think it was round six to Aiden Bars. Barsani, if I think that's his last name. He was a Kasai deck. He, he was a, a, a pretty solid pool. Um, he, he played extremely, extremely well. Um, I had a couple of misses on uh, Red Bear Fangs, um, which 
if I hit, then I'm able to take more cards out of his hand. But because I missed, then he was able to keep more, and then and then he was able to sw uh, present attacks where I was. It was hard for me to block due to the breakpoints, and then he was able to squeeze in enough damage through, through the attack reactions to close out the game. It was a it was a good back and forth game. Um, I don't remember the exact details uh, besides but besides what I just shared. Um, I wish I'm sorry. I, over the you weekend, me I don't have every single <laughs> every single match you played memorized. Uh, I, I normally try to remember how I play like every match, every game. That way I can get better. But I was so hyped up over the weekend that I, I basically didn't sleep at any night. Like th Thursday night through Sunday, I maybe got three or four hours of sleep a night. Um, Thursday it's through Saturday, only I was 17 just... rounds. <laughs> only 17 no. rounds. I was just very, like, I, I get very excited to play Flesh and Blood to, to, to get to compete. And I also don't sleep well at home. So with that combination, I just didn't get much sleep before playing in the event. And then, you know, after the conclusion event, I was just so hyped of, a, of, the, of what happened that I also couldn't sleep. <laughs> so I, uh, yesterday was actually the first night's sleep, actually sleeping in my own bed. I got, I got to sleep a full 10 hours. And today I'm like, I, I'm, my body's definitely like shutting down on me. It feels like I'm sick, even though I'm not. I, I'm like super congested. But when I, uh, this might be too much information, but all, all, all the mucus is clear right now. So I know I'm not actually <laughs> sick, but it, it just feels bad right now. It's like a con crud, but not quite. It was like you 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 were too, you were hyped up for three days straight, and your body's like, "Whew, that was exhausting. You're gonna feel like crap now." Exactly. <laughs> Got the job done though. Yeah. <laughs> you were fortunate enough. Yes. Yeah. All right. So then, day two of the the calling. Oh, by the way, Kevin also played in the calling, but he, since he didn't win, we're we're not talking about Kevin's event. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It'd be a real short conversation. <laughs> uh, so draft number one on day two. At this point, you're six and two, so you have to like do really well in these in these drafts to be able to catch up to the the, the two eight O's and then the seven ones. Uh, so draft one, uh, you end up drafting Ko. Is this a a classic Mark Morrison force, or did you? like get pushed into it or because we know you're well, not drafting guardian so. <laughs> right so the the, the plan of, the, the plan of draft was to avoid guardian because even if i got the busted guardian draft deck even if i'm the single guardian i wasn't going to be able to pilot the deck properly so we were avoiding guardian i actually did stay open for this draft um i had the choice of being either warrior or brute um i think my first pick might have actually been a warrior card I I think it might have been um, the Agi the red agile engagement, uh, but uh, in my pack one pick two I was actually passed down but not out a uh, red down but not out and I was hyped and very confused why that was there I took that um, and then I, after that I I was uh, passed good red brute cards um, I think I took uh, pick three a lead with speed and then I was alternating from picks four through seven between warrior and brute cards where then when pick eight uh, came i saw that there was more brute than warrior cards and the more good brute than warrior cards in the pack so i decided to go brute uh starting uh, uh for the rest of the pack starting uh pick eight yeah that makes uh, sense. i i don't i don't remember too much of, of packs two and three uh except for the fact that at the end of pack three, I had there's like six picks left. I was like, oh, cool. I have a really strong brute deck right now. I just need like maybe one or two more filler cards to really round it out. And the last five picks were all warrior cards. So I ended up having to play. Uh, I didn't have to play Crack Bobble, fortunately enough, because I had exactly 30 cards. But I, had to, I ended up having to play uh, Seduce Secrets, which is a slightly better Crack Bobble. Crack Bobble with text. Right. <laughs> just just enough. Just enough. Uh so so your games then. So the, these day two pods were were pretty stacked. Uh mm -hmm. any any names you recognized in your initial day two pod? Uh in, in the first pod there wasn't any like big name players. I, I was I think I was fortunate enough to like dodge all the uh, you know, former Pro Tour top eight uh aiders or other calling players who made top eights so i might have had one of the easier pods in day one uh, it was uh, in day two we were just a bunch of solid players who probably all had solid results but never never top eight anything so 
Um, so that that was nice. Um, uh, being able to be in, I guess one of the softer day uh, day two pods. Um, I actually lost my first round. So I guess like we should do the the pod the the pod breakdown. In our pod, there was actually four guardians, um, two brutes and two warriors. I, I believe what happened was four people were playing brute or drafting brute in the first pack, and then two of them jumped ship to guardian, and that's how we ended up with four guardian players. And so then my round one opponent uh, for that for that pod, I actually faced a guardian player. So I was very excited that his deck wasn't going to be very good. Uh, but nope, it ended up being extremely good. He he won the die roll. He chose to go first. He hit a yellow um, yellow or you know plus four wager, and he just set up for a, a big a big second turn. And I was quickly that the game ended very quickly. He just dominated or overpowered attacks three turns in a row, and I died. That is something weird that I in my limited drafts that I've done, like we just did a draft at our uh, local store on Sunday and we ended up with four guardians, me being one of them. We finished the draft and I'm looking through like the deck that I ended up drafting. And I was like, this is pretty, pretty solid. There's probably two, maybe three guardians. And then everybody like names off what hero they're playing. And then we ended up with four Betsy's. It's like, that's really weird. And then I, played two of the Betsy's and they also had pretty decent decks. So I wonder if it's just how the packs line up sometimes that sometimes like you can have like four guardians and still end up with a like good deck. I got to talk to a lot of the, my uh, players in my, in my draft pod um, after the pod happened or at least, or I guess after the first round happened and only two of the guardian players were very happy with the deck. The other two said that they just had a pile. Um, I, I think what happens, they were brute, they got in the Guardian late, and they, they, they were either missing the, uh, the good blue cards, or not the good blue cards, they were missing blues in general, or they were missing uh, the, the good red attacks. So the, the two that jumped in late just unfortunately had uh, either bad seats because they were you know, sandwiched, between, sandwiched between other Guardians, or they jumped in too late. Yeah, and that's... That can happen in in any draft format, though. Like the, it's it's part of what makes you know the idea of of shifting. Like, oh, I feel like I'm getting cut on this. Do I do I switch classes now? Uh, somebody else could have the same thought. One seat to your left, and mm -hmm. the both of you switch, and that's that's sort of that's the nightmare, right? Uh, but at the same time, there's only so much you can do. Uh, Any uh so so yeah so your so your first draft KO started off with a loss but rounded out the pod with a two one. I, I was able to salvage a two one at that point though I, I was a little deflated um losing in the first round really hurts my tiebreakers in the end so I thought that the only way I could potentially make top eight if there was a clean cut if there wasn't a clean cut and some X3s didn't make it, I, I for sure would have been the bubble boy uh, finish, uh, losing in the first round of day two. So going into the final pod, I wasn't super confident I even was even live for top eight at that point. Who won is super weird for Mark. If you've uh, played draft with Mark, you know he either o threes or 3 O's. There's no, there's no in-between. <laughs> Yeah, that that is the first time at at a major event. You know, I I I've been at nationals a couple times. I've been to the pro tour, and every draft I either three would or o three. I never did both in, in the same tournament. I would I would three o one draft and o three the second one. That's this consistently happens. Good time to break that streak for sure. <laughs> Speaking of three o's though, the second draft you did also ended up on KO. Yeah, so awesome. this draft, this draft pod was, um, it was it was a little bit funnier, a funny story. I had a, a few friends in the Albany area, um, who all were all doing well at the call. Uh, they had the same record as me. They lost in the same in the first round as well in the day two draft pod. So we thought there was a good, uh, decent shot at least that uh, the four of us might have all been in the same in the same draft. And then at, we're, we're just all joking and, and drafted out, uh, just, just joking around, saying, "Oh, what happens if we're all in the same pod?" And I just looked at everybody, uh, completely serious, and said, "Well, if that happens, I'm forcing KO, no matter what. Um, if if you if you want to hold, hold uh, jump on the KO train, we can hold hands in the O3 bracket, and it'll be fine." So I kind of just bullied my friends. If, dominance. <laughs> if by chance we ended up in the, in the same pod, 
in which we actually did, my friend, uh, my friends Connor and Anthony happened to both be in the pod with me, and they also happened to be to my left, uh, Connor to my left, and Anthony to my right. Um, <laughs> so it was, but obviously you don't know that like uh, your pods get uh, get posted, and then you walk to your table. You don't know um, once the, uh, your pods get posted, it's no more talking. It's supposed to be a silent process. So we didn't know that we were in the same pod till we actually made it to our uh, made it to our tables and to our seats. But we uh, we definitely laughed about it afterwards. Yeah. But within that pod, it was definitely a very a very stacked pod. I think Jacob Bow, uh, Michael Dalton, and Pat Ashke were all in that pod. So when I was looking at that, I, I knew that I'm not going to be able to outdraft those players. They probably have more reps than I do, and they're also just better players than I am. The only way I'm going to be able to win is if I can get lucky, force the hero, and just happen to be in the right seat. So for my second draft, uh, day two, I, I was definitely 100% on the force, uh, the force KO plan. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, and that, that was something that I was going to ask about. That you know how your, I guess how your approach to each draft changed, and and so mm-hmm. this, yeah, I, I I can see where, where, why you would decide that, right? Like you know, a, a really good KO deck can kind of just run over anything in this limited environment for the most part, uh, and yeah, going into it ahead of time, being like, well, I need to come out of this with a busted brute deck or i'm not going to throw this pod uh you know it's sort of a a, a called shot or a, a, a gambit right you're you're you know, not necessarily i, I know, know i need to three kind of this pod yeah. so i'm gonna right. i'm gonna mm-hmm. like get myself in the best position to do that and if it doesn't work out and five other people draft brute then I I wasn't I wasn't gonna three out anyways so. right like when when you go into that draft pod and your goal is to have have a chance give yourself a chance to top eight and you know the only way to do that is 3-0 i'm willing to take more chances to make that 3-0 happen even if it increases my chances to 3 because to me a, a 2-1 and a 0-3 that that was that that ends in the same result and that's a missed top eight Not i know some SP. people still i know some people still you know care about maybe trying to top 32 um, I personally ha- have have top thirty two big events before, so I was hoping to have a, a little bit higher goals in mind for this tournament and and try to, and really try to make that top eight. Obviously, I, th- I haven't done it before, so there's still lots of doubt that creeps in your mind that that you're not going to be able to do it unless a lot of things fall your way. So that's why I was willing to take those chances, take those gambles to try to you know p- try to get uh, give myself a chance to get lucky. So also. Uh playing with mark a lot uh as much as he'll say he's not a good player he is a good player uh and how many how many winning ends have you ended up losing at this point it's a uh, kind of a running joke that mark always loses his winning ends so <laughs> we got a message from kevin that you were playing pat i believe in the last round of this draft right for the 3-0 mm-hmm. to have a chance to top eight and i was like oh no mark's gonna lose it's it's destiny he's gonna lose another <laughs> win in him <laughs> Although it wasn't guaranteed this time, right, right, yeah, I, I think there was like four, four Grand Prix in a row. And from, this is back when Magic: The Gathering was having Grand Prix. I lost one and ends, um, and then I lost the one and then in my first calling in Charlotte, uh, at, at the U.S. National Charlotte. Um, I didn't lose a win and end in Indy. I needed it was the second to last round. I needed to win two more, so it wasn't exactly a win and end, but. You know, it was if I can beat Tarek Patel and 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 the second last round, and I win my final round, then I would have had a chance for winning in. Um, and then at the Invitational, uh, the Realm uh, 20K Invitational, I had a win in against Yuki Bender um, when she was on uh, on Bolton, and I was I wasn't able to pull out any of those matches. Yeah, near near misses, and I, and you were, <laughs> yeah, I I can feel it. You 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 usually a pretty. I'm, stoic's not quite the right word we'll go with hard to read but like but after even even after a poker player mark mark was a poker player and it and it shows uh but he, but even after you finished the 3-0 and we were kind of just standing there and waiting for standings and waiting for standings and heading into so so prior to the last round against pat uh you were in 14th place uh in mm-hmm. the standings so you had to jump all the way up to eight to get there. Uh, and it's kind of one of those weird, you know, 
<laughs> when 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 the NFL season is coming down to it, and they're like, oh well, here's these a bunch of scenarios that can happen, and you know, it's this like oh for the Jets to make the playoff, these like four teams all need to tie in the same week, right? Like just some crazy stuff. <laughs> wasn't wasn't quite that that level of a long shot, but like you you needed you know specific things to happen in the pot above you, and it, they just kind of broke your way. And uh, yep. Anthony. Prior to the actual announcement, Anthony had pulled up his phone to look at the standings because they were published uh, on the Hartford um, uh, the, live, the, blog. The, blog. the live blog. Yeah, and he pulled it up and he was looking at it and he showed me and he, he points to it. See, you're in the eighth seed because we were sitting there thinking like, ah, even with eleven wins, you might you might have been ninth. Like it could have happened that way. And he just looks at me and he's like, "Do we tell him?" I'm like, yeah, we tell them. And uh, yeah, and that's it. The streak, the curse is broken. Mark Morris. That was a great moment. I, I, got, to, I got to hear hear that from you guys like two or three minutes before they made the announcement uh, on, on the, the loudspeakers. And I, I really, I, I was, I was really, I really thought that I finished ninth there. I think I needed two different uh, pair downs uh, to win. I needed, uh, or sorry, pair downs to lose, I should say. Um, and it, it just happened. I, I got very fortunate that uh, the players who got paired up, uh, I, f I don't know exactly which ones they were. Um, I'm sorry for their loss, but uh, fortunately for me, it, it was uh, something I was able to take advantage of. I wonder if your first loss on day one being to, uh, I can't remember his name, but he went 8-0 eight, eight no with the two cast the Corey. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, like having such a strong strength of schedule and that being like one of your losses. No, it, the way the the way flesh and blood tiebreakers work, your strength of schedule doesn't matter. All that matters is when you have those losses. So the sooner you lose, the worse it is for your tiebreakers. So I had I had the worst tiebreakers for the X threes. Um, my third loss came very early. It came the first round of day two, um, and you basically needed the X two to make day two. So I I had the worst breakers going in. Um, I knew the only way I was making top eight is if it was a clean cut where all X threes made it, um, and that's what happened. Um, those clean cut, um, the, the, all the players in front of me that I needed to lose, they finished X and four, so I was able to jump them. If, if they if they won, they would have had higher breakers than me. Yeah, yeah, the the clean cut was was the make or break it outcome for it. Yeah. So and, and something else I, I, I want to talk about too, real quick. Sure. Um, throughout the tournament, both day one and day two, as I'm playing against opponents, you know, both I, I both won and lost, but I did a lot of I, I happened to win a lot. Um, el eliminate players, you know, from making day two and day one. Like so, I'm in day one, I eliminated them from being able to make day two, and then day two, I eliminated them from being able to make top eight. Everyone was still super like obviously the, they're disappointed that they lost. Everyone showed great sportsmanship. No one was like, th um, like super salty, very upset, throwing a fit. They were all, they were all like upset, like sad that they lost, but they were still happy that I was still moving on, and there was still this gr this great sportsmanship all around from everybody. And that's that's one of the great things I love about the community. People just like playing the game. They love competing. Yes, everyone wants to win, but there's only one winner at the end of the day, and it's most likely like it's not going to be you because there's. It's, probably, it's usually Michael Hamilton. Let's be real, um, but <laughs> um, but it's, but everyone just it, 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 that's something that I really enjoy about this community. Uh, win or lose, people just love playing the game. Shout out to uh, Michael Fung and Brody Spurlock for casting and not playing, give somebody else a chance. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That was they they left two spots open and you got to take one. So I, I really appreciate it, guys. <laughs> yeah, and and. Brody and Michael, from what I've watched, did a phenomenal job. I'm excited to actually go back and watch the rest of that coverage. But uh, yeah, them, them, and Sam and Savage Feats, they just yeah continue to do a stellar job with the broadcasts. Well, it, it it makes me so like mad or jealous of Brody. He's he's so good at playing the game, and then he's just so natural at, at being a caster. He it seems like he, there's nothing he can't do. He's just naturally good at everything. I'm sure he works extremely hard as well. Because otherwise, you can't be as good. As, like you can't be the best without working hard. But he clearly has the natural talent to be successful at anything he wants to do. And yeah. I'm not trying to say that in a negative thing. It's, it's a great thing. I, I love the, I love that for Brody. I just wish I had jealous. some of that. <laughs> jealousy. Yeah. It's definitely just jealousy there. All right. On to the last, the top eight draft now, where 
everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody's really good. We, mm-hmm. uh, Kevin and our other teammate Jesse were at, were on location, but the the rest of us jumped in the Discord and we're having a watch party, rooting, rooting you on. So it was that was an entertaining time. And there's some some drama we'll we'll get to that we were all yelling at the screens about, but. So you yeah, get go, into yeah. Sorry, go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, so, so so going in the top eight draft, I had similar mindset of of my second draft in day two. I'm looking at the pod. The pod's stacked. Everyone is full of a, fully accomplished players. I'm definitely the least accomplished player within that group of players. Um, so I knew that if I tried to stay open, if I tried to just try to pick my draft my seat. If it's Guardian, I'm definitely going to lose. And even if it's Warrior, I might not have a, a great chance at winning um, because the, even if I have like the best Warrior deck, um, my opponents, could, because they're so skilled, they might be able to just pile around me anyway. Uh, might, might, uh, so I figured the only way I could possibly win this tournament is by, again, forcing a hero and trying to high roll. So I decided uh, before that draft even started was I, I'm, I'm going to force uh, Brute, whether it's Kale or Reinar, and and hope that the I'm I'm in the right seat. Um, the pack one pick one I opened up a down but not out. I thought this was going to be the best card in my deck at the time. I was like, oh, this card's this card's so good and sealed. It's going to be it's, this card's going to carry me carry me to victory. But I quickly found out that when you play against really good players, they know how to play around down but not out, and they're able to get rid of their armor very quickly. They're able to make sure that they don't have more tokens than you. Uh, they're able to make sure that the life totals aren't uh, aren't the way it is needed to, to turn that on. So I was never given a chance in any of my top eight matches to play down but not out uh, for any of its value. So it's, it, it's something that, uh, that Jesse and Kevin and I t- uh, discussed on the way back that even though down but not out is such a great card, the better your opponents are, the worse that card actually gets. Yeah, and it's in, in certain... a three for five. <laughs> right, right. Or a, a, th- a three for fake six, which is good enough for KO. But yeah, yeah, you know, and, and there will be certain games where, you know, regardless of the skill level of your opponent, things will just shake out. You'll be like, oh, great, this is turned on right now, perfect. But yeah, if if th- things drag on, that armor that armor comes out quick, right? Or especially for you know the the adversity cycle and that sort of stuff. When people get an opportunity to cash in armor they do it. it 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 goes quick and as soon as they're out you're <laughs> that that uh down but not out is never going to be on so mm-hmm. yeah definitely in previous yeah. formats in previous formats you would hold armor and wait for a for a hit effect that would like really like in welcome to wraith snatch you block with a card and then your one piece of armor to make sure that they can't draw a card but almost all the equipment in heavy hitters is so specific when you're allowed to block with it it's just uh, as soon as the condition is fulfilled and you can you probably just should just gain the gain the life yeah because of yeah. all the condition the, the, condi- the conditional armor um, unless you are like, like for sure uh, think for sure that you're able to let's say you have raw meat and you your deck is able to consistently produce mites and, and agile tokens or agility tokens then you really should just block the first chance you get so i'm um, yeah Looking at your uh, third draft deck here, and I see another knucklehead. Flashback to your sealed deck. Yeah, so... I, I also see a cast bones. So it seems <laughs> like the uh, <laughs> real power cards. Yeah, so be- I guess before we get to those two cards specifically, uh, so- let me do a recap of uh, pack one. So pack one, uh, I-, I, was- I took the uh, pack one, pick one, the red down but not out. And then from there, I just took any brute cards I saw, um, and my it definitely seemed like I was getting cut from brute cards because there weren't many brute cards within the packs that I was receiving, which is both a positive and a negative. Some people might ask, why is that a positive? Well, if there's no brute cards in the packs that I'm passing or that I'm receiving. It means I'm not passing any brute cards, which means that everyone to my left won't be in brute. Uh, it means pack two will be the pack that I'll need to be a really good pack in order to fulfill my deck. Um, and that's really what happened. So pack one, I just, I took, if I saw a brute card, I took it. And if there were no brute cards, I just end up taking like uh, generic generic blues, which are fine. Um, they're not the best if they're block twos, like, you know, like blue trade in, 
um, uh, blue reinforced line. They're not things you really want to be playing, but they're not, you know, they're not embarrassing to play. Um, so th that was pack one. I think at the end of pack one, I counted my blues. So I had seven blues, a couple reds, and no armor at this time. So I really was hoping to open up some brute armor, and I was have, feeling like, well, if anyone to my left opens up the armor, I'm guaranteed to get it because they're definitely not in brute. And so we go to pack two. And I think, I think it, I opened the pack and I saw a cast bones. And I was rethinking about my deck. Uh, Kevin, actually, you were there. Do you remember if it was pack two that I saw the cast bones or was it pack three? I think the cast bones was, was pack three. Okay, then and ignore I what I just said about the cast bones. <laughs> we'll, we'll just forget about that. Pack two was just was just the pack where I was getting everything I wanted. I think I, pack two, my pick one was a, a red bear fangs, which is a, a very solid overrate uh, brute card, uh, especially if I'm able to hit the six. It ends up being like a two for nine, which is obviously wonderful, exactly what I'm looking for. I think my second pick, I got past the raw meat. I was like, yes, this, see, this is what I wanted. I wanted to make sure that we cut brute, and that way I'm getting rewarded now. So I did get so rewarded. In, so in that draft, where was Alexander Vore? Because he was he drafted Reinar. Where was he sitting relative to you? He was directly to my right. Okay, so that explains the the pack one struggles, because mm -hmm. on 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 the coverage, um, Michael was walking around the draft table watching stuff, and he he saw that it was the person to Alexander's right. Who opened Knucklehead in the second pack? Yes. So it got all the way around and just happened to get <laughs> to you first. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was Michael Hamilton, who's 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 to the right of uh, Vor, who opened the Knucklehead. And obviously, when I'm when I'm getting to you know pick five, pick six, pick seven, I'm not expecting to see that, that powerful of a card. But when that uh, when pick seven came and Knucklehead was there, I I saw it and just threw the card down to my pile. And then, and then proceeded to look at the rest of the, of the cards in the pack. Um, you did that Michael said, <laughs> Michael yeah, said he, that so he fast lost that... the card. He yeah. didn't see it. So the reason why he didn't see it where it went, because I just took it and then just looked at the rest of the cards. Like, oh, what am I actually passing? What else is going on? Okay, great. And then I passed the cards. I, us, I took us that on so the, fast. <laughs> us on the watch party, Michael saying, yeah, I don't know where the, the knucklehead went. And we're all like, oh, no, did did, did uh, Alexander Vor get the, get the knucklehead? And then your game was the game that was ended up being streamed. And you flipped over the knucklehead and was all like, yeah, <laughs> it made three it more around. hell. It made it around. <laughs> it, I mean, if, if I didn't get that knucklehead, I'm, I'm very confident I don't win the calling. Uh, the fact that I had three extra health was so huge in every game. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. It was it was interesting too because I you know so I got to watch over your shoulder because you happened to be towards uh you know the near corner seat at that table uh and yeah the the first pack was like it, it was all right it was a little thin you could tell the the you know the last three or four picks weren't weren't anything great and pack two into pack three just felt like it shifted completely uh looking over your shoulder when you were doing. You know, or like watching you go through the the minute of review between pack two and three, I was like, man, there's there's some juice in there. This is really good. And then you finally got yeah. to pack three. <laughs> Even before we got to pack three, pack two, like my last three picks, I got past uh, three block three block brute cards. It was great. After two packs, I counted my blues. I had eleven blues. I was like, great. I don't need any more blues. If I can upgrade my upgrade my blues, we're in great shape. But I had I think twenty five playables that I was like not embarrassed to play. Uh, granted, that is including my armor piece. I had the raw meat and the knuckle at the time, but only needing to have only needing really two more equipment pieces and seven more playables to have a thirty card deck. I felt really confident going in the uh, going into pack three that I was in the right spot. And the universe decided to reward that confidence uh, with a pack three cast bones in your initial yeah, pack. I, <laughs> so I opened up cast bones and I'm looking at it. So before um, before we, we go to pack three, you have time. You have a minute to review your your current picks. So when I'm reviewing my picks at these type of events, I'm, I want to count how many blues do I have, how many sixes do I have, and what armor pieces am I missing. So in my head, I just keep saying I have 11 blues, 
I have like uh, a, a 12 sixes, I think, 11 or 12 sixes, and I have a head and a chest. So I, that's just going in my head over and over again as I'm looking at a new pack, looking at new cards, and I, and I make my selection. So when I saw that cast bounds, I was like, well, how does cast bounds fit in my deck? Obviously, it's very powerful. Um, I don't need any more blues, but do I have enough sixes to actually make cast bounds valuable? And I kept saying, I have 11 sixes. I'll probably get, you know, four or five, maybe six more in this pack. Um, but is 18, is it 17, 18 sixes enough for cast bones to be very powerful? Um, I, I, I decided it wasn't. I actually just ended up taking a, a, a blue six. Uh, I, I think it's called, I think pack call, is that a blue six? Pack call, um, yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think I ended up just upgrading one of my blues. So yeah, it, it's a six, it's a blue. I don't have to play blue reinforce the lines now. It's a blue, um, it's, it's, a, it's a KO yeah. six. It's a, it's a five, but <laughs> right, it can, right, we'll, right. Count, we'll count it. Yeah, so I think that was actually the, the pick I took over Cast Bones. Um, and then I, I kept getting cards like blue Agile Windup. I think I'm, I might have gotten past the yellow or red Agile Windup as well. Maybe a, a couple more of those. No, I got past I got past two more blue Agile Windups and a yellow Agile Windup with Impact 3. So my deck was just filling out perfectly. I was like, oh, this is great. Now I have Agility in my deck. I got past the, a, lead, a red lead with Speed. I was like, this is great. Um, and then I actually wielded the Cast Bones which I was shocked. I was like, wow, this is, this is, I'm definitely taking this. This is the highest upside potential card there is in this pack. So we, we were rewarded. We were able to upgrade the blue and get the, the, the potential of the most powerful card within that pack. Yeah. So we... Alexander Vore being on, being on Reinar, I'm wondering what did he take over the cast bones? I, I don't think it's as powerful in, in Reinar, but, like, I think I, str- I, the pack think I remember. Over. I think I remember there being a red trade in that pack. So my mm-hmm. guess is that was the next best card that he would have taken. Yeah. Um, and maybe some people might think red trade in isn't very good. I, I I value red trade in very highly. I think it's strong in both brute in both brutes, and it's really good in Kasai. Um, in the brutes, you know, in Reinar, in, you has go again and intimidates, which is great. In in KO, it's a really it's a zero for four go again when you play it from your arsenal because you make a might token. And against Kasai, it, it's a go again that makes all your swords cost zero. It's really the perfect card you're looking for in those three heroes. Uh, it's not that good in Olympia, not that good in Guardians. But if you're in Kasai, Reinar, or KO, it's definitely a card that you want to pick, be picking highly. I think on the coverage they said that uh, Alex ended up with like four red trade ins. It makes sense why I didn't get any of that because that's something I I really want to pick up and that's and I just didn't have uh, as many trade ins as, as I was expecting. Yeah, yeah, he definitely identified at a at an early point that you know okay this this trade in Reinar dual claw aggro was was the way he was going to go and it was it was interesting because I think I watched uh, so during pack three I you know could see. That, that whole side of players and I watched like two two at least two in a row just assault and batteries get passed to you like mid mid to late portions of that pack and I'm just like man that's e- even if it's a yellow that's still just a card that you can't have too many assault and batteries in in a brute deck in this format I feel like yeah I I, I loved it I loved being past that um I also got past lead with power red lead with powers i think i ended up with three in that draft um it's not a super high pick but you know getting pick seven pick eight a red lead with power it's something i'm very happy to be drafting all right so now we've we finished up the draft you are the eighth seed which mm-hmm. means that you don't get to pick whether you go first or second in any of these um <laughs> any of these games so i'm curious what did your opponents tend to choose? Because I have I have my own opinion on this. That I'm wondering what your opponents chose. I can actually talk about this for the entire day too. Um, we can talk about going first and second. Day one in in the calling, I won the die roll every single time, every single round. Game one, it was an unbelievable streak. Um, day two in the draft portions i lost the die roll every time so you know everything evens out but i didn't expect it to even out that quickly 
And then, obviously, in top eight being the eighth seed, I don't get to choose. I, it's like losing a die roll. So I lost nine straight die rolls on day two. Um, all my Guardian opponents chose to go first, which makes sense. Guardian, uh, Guardians, especially if you're Betsy, you're trying to either uh, turn zero, play a, a big overpowered attack get your to get my life down uh, lower uh, very quickly and, and also wager it and get that value or play one of the, uh, the Guardian auras. So all my Guardian opponents decide to go first. Uh, the Warrior opponents, specifically Kasai, they alternated whether they wanted to go first or second. Um, some of them wanted to go first. And if they were going first, they were, they were trying to fatigue me. They were hoping that I had 30 cards in my deck, and they were hoping that, they were, that we were swinging out. Um, if they thought I was a more aggressive KO, then they chose to go second to try to take tempo. So it was really them trying to guess which KO I was. Which is probably something that I should pick up on sooner. I probably shouldn't pile shuffle in front of my opponents. Um, I like pile shuffling this accounting my deck, but then I realize when I'm counting out my deck, then my opponent also gets the account of how many cards are actually in my deck, and they'll know if I'm more of a mid range or aggressive uh, KO if I have 30 or 35 cards. That's something I'm just thinking about right now. Because once you uh, present, and you can ask your opponent how many cards they're playing. You've already chosen at that point whether you're first or second. But right. you shuffling before the game, like during the, the die roll, lets them have a little bit of extra information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially like when I played Cody in the finals, like obviously he had the, the option of going first or second. And um, we're sideboarding, and I asked him, like, um, do you know if you want to go first or second? He took his time. He said, yeah, I, I don't know yet. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to think about it. And it's probably because he wanted to see me count out my deck and actually see how many cards I, again i didn't think about the time but i'm thinking about that right now and if that was the case that's that's really smart so if you had gotten to choose if you had been the one seed instead of the eight seed what would you have chosen with the deck that you ended up drafting because i had so many agile windups i i just wanted to go second there's a, a really strong chance i i'm able to make agility on my opponent's turn zero and then on my first turn, I, I can just, uh, you know, probably swing out for 14, 15, maybe even 16 damage on turn, my turn one pretty, pretty consistently. Um, and then from there, my opponents will be on the back foot for the rest of the game. I had multiple red bear fangs, um, you know, which again, a two for nine. Uh, I had a, a, a lot of leader powers, which are one for fours. I just had, a, I just had the deck to want to the, put the foot in the gas and not let up. So for this specific deck, I definitely wanted to go second. But speaking of putting your foot down and not letting up, <laughs> your first game <laughs> felt <laughs> like it was you attack with your cards and Yanji block with their cards and rinse repeat until the end of the game. Yeah, I got I got really lucky that game that I drew the cast bones at the time I had uh, an agility token, so I was able to swing for I think I think I played a, a lead with power and strung with a claw. And then I was able to play a cast, a cast bone follow up. So I'm able to, to, I think I was swinging for sevens. I had a might token. I created an additional might token. And then cast bones came down. I, I hit four hits. So then I had five bite tokens for my following turn with an arsenal. And I think that was, that was, I think that was the turning point. Uh, so anyway, uh, I actually didn't play cast bones in my other two rounds. When I saw that Yanji was playing Victor, I thought there was a chance that he would try to fatigue me. And because of that, I decided that I, if that is true, I probably need um, a, have some big explosive turns, even if it means taking a turn off and attacking. And that's why I, I brought cast bones in specifically against Victor. So what does uh, Victor do again, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so it's an inside joke here, but I don't know what most flesh and blood cards do. Um, I don't know what my cards do. I don't know what my opponent's cards do. Um, so when I sat down in the quarterfinals and I get presented with a Marvel Victor, there's no text on it. Um, and I'm very confused why there's no text. So I had asked the judge for a token Victor just so I, I knew what his abilities were. Um, I still don't rem recall exactly what it does, but it's something, you know, if it wins, if it wins, uh, if it makes gold, it draws a card with clashes. And then whenever you clash, they can sacrifice gold to undo, to basically re-roll one of the cards. It's, you know, I know it's not exactly what it does, but it's just... <laughs> close enough. That's pretty close. It's pretty close. That was, uh, yeah, so they they didn't actually have uh, 
Victor with text like on hand at the feature bench table. So I like dug one out of my bag and gave it to him. And then we all chuckled when we realized that the uh, prize ticket booth was about 20 feet away and there were two giant <laughs> Victor cards on the prize wall. Could have just been bringing it over all obnoxious. But now, now you know what Victor does. Your 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 description was pretty accurate. Not not exact, but pretty accurate. Like I said, we were doing a a, a watch party in uh, in Discord, and at one point, uh, Yanji's might token pops, and then he uh, attacks with a performance bonus, which if it hits, makes a gold. And since it was played from Arsenal, had had to go <laughs> again. So we're all like. Knowing that you don't know what the heroes do, we're like, oh no! Is, does he does he know that if this hits, Yanji's gonna draw a card? But it's it's snatch with go again. Don't let it hit, Mark. We're all yelling at our screens, and you did not let it hit. So yeah, I was fortunate enough that I had I had an agile might token up, so I, and I had one counter on my raw meat, so I was able to fully block out the, uh, that attack, and then swing back for a lot. Yeah, most yeah, most I, turns I, of that game into Yanji, you know, like he he attacked you a couple times, but you mostly mostly just ate the attacks. Uh, you know, yeah. I, when the game started, I wasn't sure if he was going to try to fatigue me or if he had like maybe the specialization with overpower. Um, so I know he attacked me for like seven on, on turn zero. And I had all two blocks in my hand, which felt, it felt really bad. But I was like, I really don't want to make the same mistake that I almost made in day one, where I let my life get down too low and then die to the overpower specialization. So I decided, I decided to block out my entire hand. So I gave him four cards for one. It didn't feel good, but I really just didn't want to die to an overpower. Yeah, that makes perfect um, sense that over overpowers. <laughs> Overpower is real scary in this format, uh, especially when, well, particularly when you're not a warrior. Yes, but then from that point on, and I counted my deck counted, and counted Yanji's deck, I knew that I had to be very conscious on uh, how I use my cards uh, and when I attack. So there were some points in the game where I had the option to continue attacking, but Yanji still had cards he could just blocked out with. So I decided to actually be take less efficient turns, essentially take turns off, where I would maybe just attack with my claw, like maybe attack with like a, a lead, with, a red lead with the power into claw. I still have two cards in my hand, and I can still, I can still attack if I wanted to with maybe like a yellow assault the battery. But I actually would would just decide, you know what, I'm just going to arsenal and try to have a bigger turn later. And if you want to watch, yeah, sorry. If you want to watch that game, it's uh, streamed, so you can watch that specific one. True. On the mothership YouTube, Bad PCG. Both both that top eight game into Yanji and your finals match into Cody, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, <laughs> so so you did that in, into Yanji. You did get to do the cast bones, uh, and it it basically you know so it was still good, right? It's still that card was a zero for four for you, effectively with like effectively with go again, except delayed by a turn. So it helped mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think, on on that turn, because you also, I believe you had also discarded an Agile windup, and uh, so you had five Might and an Agility going into uh, a four or five card hand. And yeah, that, that following turn, I think you attacked for over 16 damage, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think it could have been more, but I think I missed on my red bear fangs. I had two red uh, sixes in my hand. Uh, I think one was down but not out, and I can't remember what the other six was. And then I actually drew a blue might, uh, mighty wind up, or I think that's what it's called, uh, five power, but it's KO six. So I was like, cool, I, I sh I'll be able to swing back with a, another, maybe a red seven this turn. Um, but the random draw off bear fangs, I mean, the random discard off bear fangs actually made me discard the blue mighty wind up. Uh, so I, I ended up only being able to, to finish my attack with uh, with a claw. Uh, I'm thinking you probably mean rawhide rumble, because mighty wind up would have been a six. But rawhide rumble? No. 
the the six it was a six so i still the he lost I the hit. blue card that he would have needed to attack. oh you lost you're yeah talking I, about the I lost resources. the resources okay. i thought you meant you were missing Correct. you missed the damage but that makes more sense oh no no i so i got that damage I, with, with the hit but i missed on the resources to play a, a red seven gotcha gotcha makes sense um but yeah i think no. that happened also in my finals match against cody too it happened. It happened a couple of times, but that's that, that, that's the variance within the game. You, uh, it's built in. You build your deck around it, and you just try to make the most optimal lines, knowing that that's a possibility. Yeah, and the you know the the fail state, while not stellar, still isn't too bad in most cases. Like obviously, mm -hmm. you know, mi missing on bear fangs, you lose out on three total points of value, which which is rough. It's a huge it's a huge downgrade in terms of what you're doing but uh you know it, it's probably not as punishing as uh as missing on a wild ride when you were primed for a big turn so fortunately right. i don't know if that one happened in your top eight now because of the flaw on, on wild ride i actually didn't draft it wild ride very early i might have ended up with one wild wild ride uh red wild ride I think it was actually like a 14th pick. Like, I think it was just passed to me because I don't think uh, Alexander Vor just happened not to take it and then no one else was in Brute. But it, it was a card that I was not drafting very highly. I, I could be wrong there. I know you need to go wide against the against the Guardians uh, to, to not get fatigued. But it's a card that has such a low floor that I, I wanted to, to try to play a more consistent KO, which I know it's an oxymoron because Brutes are, have, has a lot of variants built in. But I, I want to be able to control what variants I, I choose to embrace. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. And, you know, the, like, you know, some, a, a one cost buff into Bear Fangs, like, that's that's a whole turn right there, right? Like, if, mm -hmm. if you're playing Wild Ride and you want the go again, you have some kind of expectation about either floating available resources after that point or what's still in your hand afterwards to follow up with uh, with additional attacks. But, it doesn't, I don't know, Wild Ride doesn't give you full agency over that, and especially mm -hmm. so in uh, in Limited, when when your deck is not going to be, you know, 54, 6 power cards like the CC versions can do. Exactly. All right, so on to your next game that was not streamed, but all of us in Discord are just staring at Discord, waiting for Kevin <laughs> to text us updates on how the game is, is going, and we're waiting on the edge of our seat. So give everybody just like like a quick recap of that one, since it wasn't mm -hmm. stream. They can't just watch it. Yep. So the, the, the semifinals match was against David Lee. Um, he was a Kasai player. Um, in the first you know, the first cycle of the game, I was playing more of a, of a mid-range style. Um, I was just bl bl blocking out, keeping my life t uh, uh, life total pr pretty high, and swinging for seven. Um, I, I did that for the uh, for the first cycle mainly because I didn't have agility and I couldn't couldn't do that. Uh, couldn't have better plays um, because I didn't have agility for the first cycle. I was actually able to pitch deck um, uh, my, all my agile windups to be in separate hands. So I think there was once we hit second cycle, it was four uh, three straight turns of me discarding Agile windup and then playing a red lead with, for pow uh, lead with power uh, with my claw and being able to keep swinging. Um, and then David having to basically block out the entire hand. Um, and that was really the game where the, the first cycle was playing mid-range and the second cycle was David just being having the block out. Otherwise, he, he was, because he was too low on life, he would just die due to damage. So he ended up um, essentially fatiguing himself. Yeah, I think he had he had an awkward hand where he had one too many two blocks. But he only had like one card left in his deck, so it it was it was essentially fatigue. Mm -hmm. We had that in one of our uh, 
test games, Kevin, where I had the choice of either setting up a next turn or just attacking middlingly. And us both being at low life totals, knowing that if I don't attack, then you'll have more cards to hit me back with. So I took the risk of hopefully you not being able to use your whole hand on offense. So then I ended up just arsenaling. But you were able to use your whole hand, so then I just ended up blocking until I ran out of cards. So it's uh, an interesting... I feel like people are... I feel like we need we need a, a middle name for it, because fatigue is not quite... <laughs> Like it doesn't encapsulate what's the game state. Well, you you got exhausted. You you're exhausted because we just kept swinging until you got tired. Maybe I don't know. I feel like there. I've seen people say like, "Oh, this format goes to fatigue a lot," but to me, it's a very different fatigue than like Bright Lights was. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe that's just me and my brain not being able to or like it feels like the two two separate games like the bright lights limited like where it's just like blocking and waiting for you to run out of stuff because there's a bunch of three blocks versus hey i'm attacking for seven if you want to block it all you got to use three cards all right on to the finals yep so Which, in the, in the, go ahead. Go ahead. i was gonna say you can watch it if you want to Oh. <laughs> yeah, so in the finals, I got I got the pleasure to play against Cody Williams. Um, he was the seventh seed, so he was uh, very surprised that he uh, got to choose whether he wanted to go first or second. Um, I, I believe he chose to to go second because he won. He he assumed I was a an aggressive KO deck, which he was right. Which, which again, I think he just counted out my deck as I was pile shuffling. I believe, and then um, this. Probably count in thirty because that's why I presented, and, and so yep, he's gonna be aggressive, and we should we should go first. Uh, we should make our opponent go first here. Um, I had the I had an interesting option turn one. I think my opening uh, turn zero, I should say. I had a red lead with power. I had a a yellow trade in, and the blue, and then a I forget what the the red card was. I think it was a red bear fangs, and. I definitely wanted to play the lead with power so I can make a might token. Um, I didn't want to play the trade in to discard my bear fangs, uh, uh, even though it, it would make an additional might token, because I, I really didn't want to put a blue in my arsenal. Um, I also had the option to potentially not swing at all and just you know just play the lead with power, make a might, and then pass. Um, that way, Cody doesn't get a chance to filter his hand. But I, I didn't think having the, the, the yellow trade in and the additional blue in my hand uh, was, was very strong because I, th- I believe they were both two drops and they were attacks. So I, I really wanted to get them out of my hand. So what I, what I decided was I decided to play the red lever power, pitching the yellow trade in, and, uh, and then pitching the blue to attack with, the, with my claws. Um, sure, sure. Attacks for six, but I never thought the six was getting, going to get any damage in. And I knew it was it was going to fil- uh, Cody could filter, but I, I think that was the best play I could have done. Uh, but maybe there's there's more arguments there that I shouldn't uh, I shouldn't be attacking and letting him filter. What are your thoughts there? I think if I was in that situation, I either make the play that you did, or I just play the trade in. And don't discard to it. Because uh, it's an option, right? It's a may? Yeah, you may discard. That, that, so, that is an option, and then you that, keep you the don't blue, get... you keep mm-hmm. the lead with power, and then you arsenal the bear fangs so that you know you have, like at minimum, that three-card play for your next turn. But if you do that, then you lose out on the might token. So you, you essentially lose out on one damage. Yeah, but you're just gonna get it next turn if you when you play the lead with power the next turn, to delay it by one. At least in my brain, that's true. But yeah, I, I guess I guess because I had three lever powers, I'm thinking I, I potentially could just draw another one, and then I'm missing out on value. That's possible. And you you want to get all your value out, um, every turn. Yep. So last thing to chat about is the uh, the drama. That all of all of us at home 
in, in the middle of that game, you, uh, I mean, I know that you do this because I play with you a lot, but uh, when you finish your turn, you, like, put out the cards that you're going to draw, and you put your deck down, and then you just wait for your opponent to do something um, so that then you pick up your cards and make a decision. So you did that, except you put five cards out. So instead of four. <laughs> so all of us at home are screaming at our uh, computer screens like, Mark, don't pick up those cards. Don't touch them. And meanwhile, Cody is thinking about uh, the turn that he's going to have. <laughs> and we're just watching a train cra- or a, a train derail. Um, but And it's just slow motion that you go to scoop up your five cards as the judge comes on to screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why. Like, I, there's multiple reasons why um, I actually lay down my my hand face down and count to four. Um, unfortunately, it, it, one of the reasons is is to prevent this from happening. I don't want to draw five cards because obviously that's just a great way to lose the game on the spot. Um, at least in Magic, if uh, when, I started doing it when I played Magic: The Gathering, if you drew, ever, ever drew an extra card, it was just an automatic game loss. Yep, you drew an extra card, get lost, move on to the next one. So I would always train myself to make sure uh, when you draw a card, make sure you put you count it and put it face down. So that way, if you draw too many, you can easily just put the top card back on top of your deck. No problem. So that's just a habit I formed from, from Magic. Um, a secondary habit I formed from a different card game is actually from, from Texas Hold'em, from poker, is you actually never look at your cards until you have to. Until it's your action, so you, so uh, it's for two reasons really. The first one's the main reason, so your opponent can't get a read off you. If you know what you have, and you're, you might think you're good at masking tells, but you don't you don't know how good each opponent is at reading your body language. Um, I don't want to give off any extra information to my opponent. I'm not sure how good they are at studying body language, um, but I just don't want to give them any free information. So I just won't look at my hand until I mean, like I counting have to. out your deck before they decide if they're going to go first or second. <laughs> no free information like that. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then the secondary information, uh, the secondary reason, which is very minor, I don't think this actually happens, um, but there's a chance it could be happening. That if for some reason, you know, my opponent has friends watching behind me and they then they signal in what I have. Again, I don't think that's ever happened in any game I played, but I also would never know. So it's just like, uh, it's more like a, a security blanket for me where my, my opponent has to make a decision and, and they I know 100% they do not know what I have. It, it was just unfortunate that I, I, I it's definitely from the, the sleep deprivation that I, Definitely count into five. I just didn't realize it was five cards. Yeah, the us knowing that if you have to reveal your hand, which is the normal fix for drawing too many cards, and then mm-hmm. Cody gets to pick one to put on the top or bottom, right? Yep. It, the information that that gives Cody so as a war, as a warrior, knowing exactly how many attacks, what's coming back at him on the following turn, how you can how you can block or not block these. Uh, reactions is so much information that it probably loses you the game. So uh, we are sitting at home hundreds of miles away, just screaming at the screen like, no, Mark, don't pick up those cards. Yeah, I definitely think I just lose the game on the spot there if Cody gets all that, basically, essentially free information and has the chance to choose where the where the, uh, the, the card's going to go. Um... I was just very fortunate that the judge got there in time and we were able to prevent that from happening. It was lucky for me, unfortunately for Cody, that the Bear Fangs was um, in my next hand. So I had the Bear Fangs with the Libra power. I did think able... it was... Uh, I'm not a judge, but I did think it was a strange fix that the card that you <laughs> saw, or at least they they didn't know for sure or not that you saw, the cards that you put face down and then you went to put them into one pile and then started to flip it up before they stopped you was the the lead with power it was just interesting to me that that was the card that they chose to put on the top or the bottom but that card would have been in your hand no matter what right that that was the first card i was supposed to draw for the turn um right. and 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 i when the judge asked like what happened like what i do i told him i, I counted out my duck and i pointed to the card which i believed to be what the, the fifth card I drew, which should have been the card on top of my deck. Um, the initial judge was ready to put that card on top of my deck, 
um, Cody uh, just wanted to be safe and say, hey, can you just check the cameras? It's a stream game. Can you just make sure that's the correct card and put the correct card on top of the deck? Right. But it, I think it obviously would have been better for me if I actually got to put the fifth card that was supposed to be the fifth card back on top of my deck and then not having Cody with any agency or and, and, and any free information. It would have been better uh, yeah. for my game at least. But again, that's my mistake. Um, that's not on the judges. I, I, um, I, I, I have to be more careful when I'm doing that. Um, I try to be. That's why I, I, I deliberately put the cards face down and count it out. But, you know, sometimes things happen. 17th round, three hours of sleep, and three <laughs> days. Something, something, something. Yeah. But if, but if that's the way I would have lost the finals, I would have no one else to blame but myself. Um, I think that my probably had a slight not, not not like a super high roll but definitely luckier that game i think i played all three bear fangs and i think two of them hit so i was if those if both of those don't hit if if the two out of three of my bear fangs don't hit and they miss um then i don't think i win that game but i think i was very fortunate there i was also i guess i don't i can't remember if when i did the final attack if that was the second cycle or not, I don't think we were there yet. Um, but so I, if if we weren't there, then I was lucky that Cody had uh, all his two drops clumped together, so that my final attack was able to leak the damage through. Um, if it was the second cycle, then I was again probably either Cody uh, needed to pitch deck differently, or he he got unlucky that the way his hands lined up and the attacks lined up throughout the game, that that's the way the second uh, the second uh, stack uh, ended up looking like it. I think Did you draw that blue out. trade in again? No, that's it was because that was, was the first. That was the first card you pitched. Right, it was a yellow trade in. I never saw a yellow trade in again. So that that was definitely a first cycle draw. Way to go, Alex. Way, way to use the logic. Uh, but I, I I guess the most interesting play that I uh, controlled that game was my like boots or my yeah my boots piece. What's it called? Overcome adversity, I think. Um. I, I could have blocked like the very first turn that Cody had agility, but I I felt that Cody probably had multiple ways to make agility, and he was attacking me with the, with just a, a sword, so a vanilla two, um, and I really didn't care about the damage, and I, he, there was no on hit, so I I figured in the future he's probably going to activate his eye, he'll probably have more agilities. I, I should try to save this armor for as long as possible to try to prevent an on hit uh, for a later point in the game. Um, I know that's one thing that one play that might might have been questioned by by, by we me. Cer- we certainly did. <laughs> in, in oh, the we're like, you, you have down but not out. You need to block your equipment as fast as possible. Uh, but I, then I, <laughs> later, <laughs> later when you were able to block with it at a key moment, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, good job, Mark. There's a reason you're there and we're not. <laughs> I I also assumed that my red down but not out was never going to be played for value because I had knucklehead and rawhide. In fact, I have two temper pieces of armor. I just think I'm always going to have more armor than my opponent. So I don't think I'm ever going to be able to turn it on. Even though I tried really hard to make sure I was lower on life the entire game. Um, but because of the armor, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. It's also think about if I am blocking with all the armor and get down to less armor than my opponent, that means I'm probably at higher life because I prevented all that damage. All right. That just goes back to the, the initial talk like uh, that we talked about. Yes, uh, down but not out, very, very powerful card. But it's really difficult to, to turn on, especially against good, good players. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think that about covers it. That's a hell of a run. Uh, an excellent way to break the the streak of top eight bubbling that you had. <laughs> uh, congratulations again. It was uh, <laughs> it was really awesome to get to watch. It, it's it's is kind of a, a surreal moment, but uh, I I feel like it I feel like it sunk in after afterwards when we were, <laughs> you me and Jesse were sitting at a Chipotle just like eating burritos in silence and uh, yeah, that, that's when the adrenaline was finally starting to come down. I was, I was just hyped on adrenaline that entire top eight. Uh, really, the, the entire day, just even st- still having a chance to top eight, even though at the time I thought I, w- I wasn't going to make I didn't have a chance, but it's still that slim chance. You, you still keep fighting. You still keep hoping. 
I find it very funny that in Constructed, you play Dramai and pretty much nothing but Dramai, but your first major win comes from playing Brute. <laughs> <laughs> your arch nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> The ultimate yeah, irony. I, I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate that, that KO came through for me. Uh, that I had more hits than misses uh, throughout that tournament for sure. Yeah, but you always it, look. Anybody who's won a TCG tournament like this, they gotta know you. You gotta you have to play well the whole weekend, and you also have to get lucky in a few all important spots. And uh, this was just your weekend. It all came together. Yeah. What's funny is because I won a limited calling, people are going to assume I'm actually good at limited, which it's not true. I just happen to put myself in position to win the KO. I really have to learn Guardian before the Pro Tour. I can't have the disaster of the last Pro Tour. No, was it the Pro Tour or Nationals? What was Vegas? Nationals. Was that Nationals? Nationals. The, yeah. the 03 chain draft. <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know, for that draft, I just forced Prism every draft. Um, that was the only hero I knew how to play. And then I'm sitting there in day two, and there were five people forcing Prism. So, and I saw Chain was wide open. Normally, I just say, whatever, I'm going to stick with Prism. But I really felt that everyone else was going to stick with Prism, which they did. So I jumped into Chain. And I didn't know how to, I've never played a game of Chain. I didn't know how to play with it. The deck might have been sweet, but I owed three because I couldn't, I couldn't beat, I couldn't even beat the bad Prism decks that were playing Bobbles because I didn't know how to play Chain. And they just fatigued me. Learning moments, learning moments. That <laughs> that that same that same event. I was like, I I had a draft where I ended up on chain. Midway through pack two, I'm like, I should audible to Bolton right now, but I don't really know if I can. Looked wide open. I I, I think we had actually ended up in that draft had actual zero Boltons in the pot at the end of it. It was four two two with four chains, and I was a chain. Uh, and yeah, between <laughs> between your chain draft. And my not audibling to Bolt, and we're like, all right, this is something we are going to address for future events. We're going to make sure everybody can play each of these heroes, and we know how to draft, and we know when you can, uh, you know, when you can reasonably afford to audible, something like that. Yeah, I was also just looking back at my results from the pre-releases that I played in. Um, I didn't win many games of the pre-releases. I lost most of them to, to all of our locals. I know it's a joke, but I don't think I've ever won an Armory in, in Cleveland, Ohio. It just it just hasn't happened. So I, I have more calling wins than army wins. <laughs> we play against a lot of a lot of battle hardened champions around these parts. It's true. It's true. It's uh it's it's pretty stiff competition out there for sure. But it definitely makes you better. It's great practice. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's look. That's just your next big mountain to climb. Uh, you've you've won a calling. Now you come back to Cleveland. And you you got to put your put your stamp on one of these armory events. What's the softest store? Maybe I'll show up then. Yeah, that'll be my chance. What's a place that has two people showing up? I might be able to win two matches. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll think on that. We'll we'll figure out. We'll find a find a reasonable armory for you too. But uh, Mark, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Being our first ever uh, guest that we that we host. Uh, it was. Awesome getting to watch your event run and awesome getting to hear you recount it today. Uh, any parting thoughts for the viewers at home? Or shout outs. Or shout outs. Uh, no no shout outs this time. Uh, I guess it's a, I can go on a, a longer tangent in the future, but I, I'll try to do like a, a short summary of this one. I, I made a, a Twitter post, which is half joking, half not, about that I'm officially the, the least skilled calling champion. Uh, I'm officially the first, the least skill calling champion. And I know some player uh, people posted, "Oh, you're you're you're, you're cutting yourself short, uh, too short. You have to have more confidence." But I guess like maybe I overrate my opponents or at least their skill level. It's something I'm really good at. Is I understand what my strengths are in the game, and and I know where I can improve. When I think of what the perfect, the perfect flesh and blood player to be. Is somebody who can not only execute on all of their plays, uh, that's like, maybe not execute all the plays, but being able to find the most optimal line or uh, the most efficient line for every hand. I think that's the bare minimum you need in order to be successful at this game. That's something I think I'm decent at. Um, that's why I was able to win a calling. I was able to play efficiently. But things I'm very poor at. I couldn't tell you 
all 30, all, the, all 30 cards in my deck as I'm playing. I feel like if you're a top player, you need to be able to know every single card in your deck. You need to know exactly what the odds are of you drawing your sixes, exactly how many blues are left, how much power you have. That's not something that I was able to do. Um, I, I can play the four cards that I vis visibly see in my hand. This is how I block, this is how I attack, but I'm not necessarily able to set up for future turns. Um, I'm not strong at pitch stacking, and I'm not very good at all paying attention to my opponent, opponents are pitch stacking. Once in a while, I might catch a card here and there and remember, but there's just so much information that you can process, um, and that's not something, that's not, that's not one of my strengths, and, and, I, and I know that. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I don't think I'm that good at this game. I always tell people, hey, I'm not that good at this game. I might have won, I might have won a calling, but there's, there's still so much more to improve on. I really think 15 years from now, if Flesh and Blood is still a game that's happening and it's still successful, that the top players in 15 years will look back at our era in the early 20s and think that we're all really bad players if we're not able to do that. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the goal of this podcast is uh, like helping people to go from... I win my local armories i know you don't do that mark but i i'm winning my local armories i want to go to a calling yeah i want to go to a calling and do well so that's what uh that's what the goal of this podcast is help people step up their game go move up to the next level and and, be, and because of that because i know that of all the deficiencies in my game i have to take i take more chances to give myself a, a better chance to win it might not in the long run i might end up having a worse win percentage by taking those chances by forcing KO, by not being able to draft open, but it gives me a higher chance to being able to spike a tournament, which, uh, as you saw this time, I did do that, even though I was, I feel I was the worst player in that top eight. Humble, as always, Mark Morrison, who doesn't believe he's good at a game that he's great at. All right. All right. But, but, but thanks, guys. I really appreciate uh, you guys having me on this. I really enjoyed my time here. Yeah, well, win another calling, we'll invite you back. It'll be great. <laughs> win, win an armory. Yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll have you back for that, that, that tournament story next. Absolutely. That definitely sounds like bigger news for, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, uh, Mark, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Alex, my co-host, as always, it's been a delight. Uh, like, subscribe if you want. Yeah, all Mark of the things. Tell you what to do. Press the buttons if you want to. Um, we're on Apple Podcasts now. That's that's a, that's news. We're, we're working on getting on Overcast. Working on it. Working on it. Um, thanks, as always, to Chase, a.k.a. Groony Moons, for our sweet intro and outro music. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back in another two weeks with another episode of IP3. Thanks so much for hanging out. See ya.